Good morning and happy Sabbath. I know each of you is loving this gray weather, just soaking it in, right? <laughs> the one thing that I love about winter is that spring is right around the corner. <laughs> yep, um, it's always good changes of season and weather here, but um, happy Sabbath to each of you and glad you're able to be here this morning to worship with us. As our church family also, we uh, welcome you and we want to open our Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 1. There's a good opening to Peter's letter, good, some, some good points to Peter's letter that we want to cover this morning. But before we dive right into that, I think it's appropriate once again to have a word of prayer and to ask God to be with us here. Father in heaven, we do want to thank you for how you've provided for us in this past week, how you've watched over us, how you've protected us, how you've blessed us. Lord, as strange as it may sound, we want to thank you for the trials also, for the issues that we face. We want to ask that you'd help us, Lord, to have perspective on that, on, on the various problems that we have in our lives. Help us to see that from your word this morning. Help us to Glean what you want us to glean, to walk away knowing that we've not been instructed by a pastor, but we've been instructed from your word. Thank you for all your blessings. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. It's an old story about a man who approaches a Little League baseball game one afternoon. As he approaches the dugout where the kids are at, you know, he approaches the dugout of the outfielders and he looks up at the scoreboard and the scoreboard says 18 to 0. That's a pretty wide margin of difference there and, and he sees these kids in the dugout and he turns to one of the kids, he, he knocks on the dugout and says, hey, hey, you guys must be pretty discouraged. 18 to 0, you guys are far behind. And this little kid turns around and he's smiling and says, Oh, I'm not disappointed at all. We haven't even been up to bat yet. <laughs> so, you know, um, we have to find hope in trouble. We have to be able to see the silver lining sometimes. As those old sayings go, we have to be able to make lemonade out of lemons sometimes. God is an expert at that. He's a pro at being able to take bad things and turn them into something good. And I believe Peter starts to bring that out for us. There's some truth that we have to come to grips with before we get to the lemons of the situation. So there's some facts that we want to cover here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. If you're not already there, let's look together. Peter writes this letter as a changed person. Peter was not one of those individuals that you would say was just even keel, laid back, easy to get along with. Nah, he was one of those temperamental kind of people that got loud, you know, at times, got emotional, overreacted even at things, you know, spoke with his heart and not with his brain. Maybe some of you are like that. Peter was like that, you know. He, he reacted in so many different ways in so many different circumstances. So for him to write these words is very moving because his life had been changed. He had found an anchor. He had found stability in his life. And we'll go over some of the facts that he, some of the things that he went through in his life. But let's consider his words here. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I use the New King James Version. Perhaps some of you have a more modern version, the New American Standard and NIV or something like that. I like the way those newer versions actually put this uh, in the sentence, in the middle of the sentence there. Who according to his abundant mercy has what? What does your text say? Has what? Caused us to 
be born again. I like that. The, the old way of saying things is begotten, but to be born again is what is put there. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, for Peter to write this, as I said, is now a passive statement. You see, all of Peter's hope had been shaped around Jesus. When Jesus called Peter to discipleship, Peter was elated. He saw in Christ the Messiah, one who was going to fulfill all of the past prophecies, one who was going to inhabit King David's throne, the center there at Jerusalem, to be able to have the power and authority to overthrow that Roman oppression, to bring blessings, to bring wealth, to bring power into his life. This is what Peter had hoped for. Have you ever hoped for something so much that when it didn't happen, everything inside of you got crushed? Have you ever had something like that in your life? I think uh, for young people it may be a love interest, you know, somebody that maybe you had thought about and invested your whole life into only to have that person break up with you or end the relationship or something along those lines. That's crushing. And certainly some of us have been through that. I've been through that. I know what that means. You know, when you think about somebody in that way and then it just falls apart. That's exactly what Peter went through. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, everything he had hoped for, everything he had dreamed about in regards to Messiah was just thrown in the trash. He felt like his heart had been ripped out from him. You know, after he denied Jesus, he went and just wept because everything that, that had happened up until that point, he had placed all of his life in Christ, to see Christ hanging on the cross was just utter devastation. But Sunday finally rolled around, and Jesus rose from the grave. With Jesus rising from the grave, Peter began to come to grips with what God had in store for his life. And that's something that he is trying to impart and share with his readers, with you and me. In those days, letters would be read aloud, you know, they'd be brought to a place and read aloud. So anybody who heard this, this is what Peter is trying to impart. Who according to his abundant mercy has caused us to be born again to living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus did something that nobody else had been able to accomplish. Coming back from the dead. Now, the Bible says he's the first fruits, first begotten from the dead. Every subsequent resurrection from the dead was because of this resurrection, because of Jesus' resurrection. The resurrection, indeed, is the core concept of belief in Christianity. Without a resurrection, Christianity just becomes a Hinduism, just becomes a Buddhist religion, just becomes another works-related, faith-based thing that makes no concept or sense in terms of grace and salvation. The resurrection brings us hope that there is life beyond this life that there is hope beyond what we find in our own lives. The resurrection is so key to our faith and to our belief. Without Jesus rising from the dead, we'd just be worshiping a dead God. And that's what most of the world does, that uh, worships in these other faiths. They worship a dead God. But we worship a living God, one who has conquered the grave one who has overcome the tombstone, one who has risen from those depths to be alive again. And this is where we find our hope. This is where Peter wants to bring us to. And so he continues on in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven 
for you. You know, inheritance used to be a big thing, and I, I guess they are still today, to hope in what our parents have to hand down to us. Things are so, you know, depressed in our economy, in our world today. Inheritance is less of a thing, it seems, that people rely on. But, you know, Christ once told us, don't hope, don't work for those things that are perishable, things that thieves can come in and steal, things that can pass away through rust and corrosion. You know, go for the treasure that's in heaven, is what he'd have us to do. And it's important to think about heaven in that regard. You know, we think about heaven in, in, in regards to treasure and gold and all the rest of that. But that isn't the only thing that the resurrection brings to us. And I'd like to look together in Romans chapter 6, because I believe this is a very pointed chapter that Paul taught and understood, that uh, Peter understood also. Romans chapter 6 also brings to us a very deep spiritual truth that helps us in our own walk, not just in the hope of the world to come, but into our own lives now, into our own spiritual walk with our Lord and Savior. So, Romans chapter 6, key chapter, love this chapter. We're going to start with verse 1, but we're going to focus in just a little bit more uh, from 3 through 5. What shall we say then? By the way, Paul has spoken about grace and how that all has worked out through the salvation of Jesus Christ. But he does not want people to misunderstand him. So he asked this question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, okay, Jesus has given us this free gift of salvation. We have accepted it. Now we're just, are we free just to go out and to party and to, and to waste our lives on drugs? and alcohol and all the rest of it, are we just free to do that? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And look at his answer there, verse 2. Certainly not. I think the accurate translation is, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And therein, that last phrase starts to bring to us this union with Jesus that's so important for the Christian, the tie-in there that's so important for our own lives. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, Paul is not just using this symbolically. Yes, there is symbolism involved when we're baptized in the tank. But there is something very real here that we need to grapple with and understand about the resurrection. Verse 4, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. There is a union here that Paul mentions all through Romans chapter 6 that we need to understand. Jesus dying on that cross not only died in our place, but he took us as human beings into himself and died as us, literally, on the cross. So for Jesus to rise from the dead is a guarantee that if you have faith, one day you'll rise from the dead. Isn't it a marvelous promise? That's our guarantee if we're united with Christ, if we accept the union that he imposed upon humanity at the incarnation, God with us, joined with us, that one day, if we have that uh, natural conclusion of our life to die, that we have the guarantee 
of resurrection. This is why Peter mentions the resurrection giving us hope. Our faith has to be based in that. Our faith has to be based in the solid fact of what Christ has done. Not just in a whimsical, fairy tale, fantasy world of faith, but the reality and rock solid bottom of what faith should be. You know, a lot of times we take faith and we make it into this play place, this, you know, imaginary this and that and the other thing. Our faith has to be based on solid ground. And that ground is scripture. Scripture helps us to understand things like this, that Jesus united with us, that Jesus was crucified with us, for us, on the cross. To really grapple with that and to understand it, you, you see the writers of the scriptures, they grappled with it. They tried to understand it and to come to grips with it. To put it into words, it's inaccurate. And I'd be remiss to tell you that I'm doing this completely right. Because I'm not. To describe the crucifixion and the resurrection is a mystery that we'll grapple with throughout eternity. But we can gather hope from what we can understand. And we can gather faith in knowing that God is in control. So, 1 Peter. Let's turn there once again. 1 Peter. And verse 5 brings to us something that I think we need to remember. It's easy sometimes as a believer to feel like just another number, just another brick in the wall, as they say. But here's a good promise for you to hang on to. Who are kept, verse 5, by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter is speaking about us, those who believe, who are kept, who are preserved, who are protected by the power of God. Isn't that amazing? God has an interest in your life, in preserving you, in preserving your faith, in preserving your wholeness, so that one day, one day, that salvation will be revealed for each of us. Now we're approaching those last days. And you understand what Peter's getting at here. Salvation, of course, can begin now in our lives. We can live that faith and hope now. But the reality of being saved completely comes when Jesus arrives again in those clouds of glory. And this mortal puts on immortality. You got it. So that's what Peter is driving at there. God is preserving us for this time. Have you ever had, I want you to go back to your childhood, have you ever had a toy that you really, really, really liked, that you really enjoyed? I'm going to tell you a little secret about myself. Um, as a kid, I was a little bit bratty, and so um, there, was a time, there were times when I was four or five years old when I'd have a particular toy, and kids would come over, and they'd try to play with that toy of mine, and my mom says that I would dance in circles around the kid that was playing with my toy and go, mine, 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 like that, just in circles, like that. It was, um, it was because I was protective of those toys. God is protective of you. Do you know that? He loves you. When the devil approaches you and starts to mess with you, I can imagine God just wanting to dance in circles around you saying, mine, mine, he's mine, she's mine, I, that's mine. You know, God loves you that much. He wants to preserve you. He wants to protect you. He wants to keep you for himself. Have faith, friends, because that's the kind of God that we serve. Now, does that mean that we're not going to face trials and issues in life? You know, trials are so important to Christian growth. And um, I'll bring this up for you. It's, it's very important that you grasp this. Because as, uh, as you mature as a Christian, it's something you have to understand. There is no genuine walk of faith without trials. There's no such thing as genuine faith without trials. There has to be trials in our life. Now, does God like to make us suffer? No. That's not the point of it. 
but we need to get to the point of it. And I'd like you to first turn with me to James. James is right before 1 Peter. So an easy turn. James chapter 1 and verse 2 is where we start. It's very important for us to grasp this in our own walk. And this text sometimes, because I'm human, throws me into fits. Because I don't always grasp it, but I know it's true. All right? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The last thing that I want to do when I face trials is to jump up and down and say hallelujah. (laughs) That's just not my nature. I tend to be a little bit more introverted, and I tend to get scowly, tend to yell and scream and and pout and and have my little um, internal tantrums, I guess you can say. But James is giving us some guidance here. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why does he say this? Well, he helps us to understand here. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience, verse 5, verse 4, he continues on, have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. God wants us as prepared as possible to completeness so that when we go to heaven, we're ready for that existence, if you will. Verse 12 of the same chapter, James chapter 1, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Here's another reality for you. I think everybody knows this. Each of us has issues in our life that we want to bring up to Jesus. Each of us, when we get to heaven, we're going to have questions to God about some of the things that have gone on in our life. There are things that have happened, things that maybe are still, going to, still are happening, things that will happen, that have come up in your life that you've thrown up your hands and said, I don't get it. I don't know why I have to go through this. I don't know why I had to face that. I don't know why this trouble came upon me in my life. You don't get the opportunity to have that answered right now. But in heaven, you do. Jesus will account for all those things. Right now, for us though, We have to have faith and know that God knows our life better than we do. That we are so surrounded and inundated with the daily that we can't see 10 years down the road. We can't see three years down the road. I can barely see three months down the road sometimes, you know. So I have to trust and know that God is in control no matter what circumstances I find myself in. And God is just trying to work patience within me. God is trying to make me into the man that he wants me to be. So turn back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll conclude with this section here, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, gold does fade. I'm not even sure what the price of gold is nowadays. Was it $437 an ounce or something like that? Some incredible amount just for gold. Faith is more precious than that. Having faith in a God that has proven his love for you, has given all for you and wants to protect you and preserve you for that time when we get to heaven. There's an old illustration about sparrow's nest. It's a little bird, you know what a sparrow is. They say that um, if you see a sparrow's nest in a tree and you tear down that sparrow's nest, 
the sparrow will come back and, and she'll build in the same spot. But if you continue to build, if you continue to tear down that sparrow's nest that's built in the same spot, eventually the sparrow will get smart and start building on higher branches. You know, some Christians are not as wise as sparrows. Sometimes we take our faith and, and our hope and we place it on these lower branches and the devil comes and wreaks havoc on us. And so we try to rebuild right in the same place and the devil just comes and messes up life for us even more and more and more. We need to learn that lesson of the sparrow and start building a little bit higher so that it can't get to us. And of course, higher for us is closer to the Lord. It's so important that we draw close to him and learn that lesson and, and let go of the defeat of yesterday. Now the truth is, in life, and this is just general life lesson, success doesn't come automatically for most people, 99% of us. We try something, we fail. We try it again, we fail. It takes failure, lots of it sometimes, to finally reach success. And that's the reality of Christian life also. When we face temptations and trials, we try to overcome, we fail. We try again, we fail. It is not wise to give up and say, never again will I try this, all I am is a failure. <laughs> Don't do that. What we need to do is build higher and draw closer. Then success will come in our lives. The Lord Jesus wants us to be successful, to bear good fruits for his sake. But oftentimes, it takes pruning. It takes trials. It takes temptations. It takes failure for us to finally be successful in our lives. Just remember, the general course of your life is more important than the daily ups and downs. Which way are you heading in your faith this morning? Are you drawing closer to the Lord? Or are you still building that sparrow's nest on the lowest branches possible, trying to establish something that you know is going to fail again and again? <laughs> Reach high, friends, knowing that God wants to preserve you and keep you for that time when he finally comes again in those clouds of glory. Let's go ahead and sing our final hymn. The Lord is my light, 515.